Okay. Okay, so Rick Ridgeway. Thanks, Jimmy. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Jimmy. That was that was pretty cool. Um, I know on these kinds of authors engagements, uh, often called readings, that that's what authors commonly do, read passages from their book. Um, but I, uh, I decided I would do something a little different uh, than that and uh, give you guys uh, kind of an old fashioned slideshow. Um, but it's not too old fashioned because it also has a few uh, video clips in it embedded in a uh, new school way. <laughs> uh, but, but they're a series of um, photographs and, and film clips that uh, represent some of the stories uh, in the book. But yet the narration that I'll give you this evening over those photographs and video clips is, is not really uh, tracking the book, but it's, you know, because it's from a lot of the same stories um, and because the stories for me had so many deep lessons in my life that, that the, in that sense, they, they do reflect the book, but it, it's, it's, it'll be more of a compliment. Um, so with that, I might go through the tech process of um, sharing my screen and confirming with, uh, hold on, let me get to this part. And then Leah confirming with you that it's looking good and I got a, a thumbs up from there. So, you know, before I get into these slides, this is from the first paragraph of the prologue of my, of my memoir right here that, that Jimmy held up, <laughs> Life Lived Wild. And, and I, I will just read one little section here. Um, I once calculated that I've spent over five years total time sleeping in tents and most of that in small tents pitched in the world's most remote regions. And I say that not to boast, but to offer it as a measure of time spent deeply connected to wildness, because that connection has shaped the way I've lived my life, teaching me to distinguish what I call matters of consequence from matters of inconsequence. And I'm assuming all of you here tonight could benefit from knowing how to separate things that are consequential from things that aren't. And if you think about it, you might come to the same conclusion I have that it's about as important of a life skill as any of us could own. And I'm not claiming that I've got it totally figured out either because I'm on a journey like, like every all of us are. And it's a, a journey that, um, you know, started uh, as a, a young teenager when my mother gave me a subscription to National Geographic, and I read that cover story about the first American ascent of Mount Everest. And this was in 1963. And inside was this photograph of Jim Whittaker, the first American to reach the top of Everest. And I decided right then and there, that's who I wanted to be. So I bought an ice axe and some crampons, just like Whittaker's. And I got an instruction manual, how to use my gear. And, and that made my mother's <clears throat> maternal radar start to bleep. So for my high school graduation present, <clears throat> she sent me to Outward Bound School uh, in the Oregon Cascades, where I learned some of the basic mountaineering skills. And, and I was, after this, really more hooked than ever. And in college, I used every dollar I could, I could make to do odd, doing odd jobs to climb in places like Yosemite. And, and I started going to uh, Peru, uh, where I learned the fundamentals of high altitude mountaineering. And, and in Peru, I met another climber who was more experienced than me, uh, who took me under his wing. Um, Chris Chandler uh, became a really close friend and, 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 and mentor. And, and a year later, he called to say that he had gotten us both on an expedition to the Himalayas. And I said, the Himalayas, like that was my dream. And I said, what's, what's the mountain? Uh, and he paused before, he replied when he said, it's Everest. <laughs> and I remembered that National Geographic article I'd read when I was in my early teens and that photo of my hero, Jim Whitaker on the summit. And you know, here I was at age 25 following 
in his footsteps. And the expedition was <clears throat> filmed for a television special that was directed by Mike Hoover, who is lives in Kelly and I, I know is a friend of no doubt many of you. And, and he was like I was to Jimmy, my my guide and mentor as a as a filmmaker. And here he's got a scene in this movie he made of uh, my friend Chris Chandler and me going through the the ice fall back when we had to put it in ourselves. September 2nd. In only four days, they have built a route through the ice fall where it has taken some expeditions weeks. <laughs> but the top of the ice fall is hardly the summit of Mount Everest. <laughs> so for the next three weeks, we made good progress. And, and a week after that, I was on my way to the summit. But then just below the 26,000 foot level, <clears throat> my lungs congested and I had no choice but to but to go down and and my climbing partner Chris went on to to reach the top, you know, making the summit in hurricane winds. But with that, the expedition was over, and and I started my long journey down the mountain and and back home, and and I was wondering if I had it in me to be a high altitude mountaineer, and if I tried another big mountain, would would I have that same issue with my lungs, but I had a chance to find out a year later when I got a call from my boyhood hero, Jim Whitaker, and he was leading an expedition to K2, the second highest peak on the planet, <clears throat> and today, as I know many of you know, it's regarded as the hardest high altitude mountain in the world to climb, and I guess it's a good thing we didn't know that back then because even the trek to base camp was hard. <clears throat> um, we had to hike 110 miles over, you know, unmapped or untracked terrain with 450 porters carrying supplies for nearly four months that the trek and the climb was going to take. And after two weeks, we rounded a corner and there it was, like this giant pyramid, K2. And we started trekking up the glacier and that fear that I had after Everest came back and I remember my lungs getting congested and I, I felt that uncertainty not knowing if it was going to happen again and even if I stayed healthy there was just the challenge of the mountain itself. But we set up our base camp and the weather held and we started up and there were 14 of us uh, on the climb and unlike Everest on K2 there were no Sherpas. We set up camp one and then camp two and some of the team carried supplies while others pushed further up the mountain and we were now ready to tackle this feature, the knife edge, a ridge almost a mile long at an average elevation of about 13, 000, 23,000 feet. And we'd only managed to get started when the weather turned. And at first we stayed in our high camp, hoping the storm was gonna be short, but we were using food and fuel that we'd really worked hard to carry up so after four days we had no choice but to go all the way back down to base camp and the storm lasted over a week but when it cleared we had to work really hard to get back to our previous high point and finally we were ready to cross the knife edge which was also the precise border between pakistan and china and after four days we got to the other end of the ridge but there was no really obvious place to set up our camp so we didn't have any choice but to take our ice axes and, and hack the top of the ridge off and, and make platforms for our tent. And, and now we were ready to push to the next camp, but before we could even get started, the next storm hit and again, we didn't have any choice but to lower all the way back down to base camp. And, and this one lasted a, about a week. And then finally, when it cleared, we climbed back up the ropes and it took over three days to dig out all the tents. And, and now looking up, you can see there the, the summit headwall that was still in front of us, but tempers were getting thin and, and so was the food supply. And we've been on the mountain at this point for over a month. So we pushed up to the next camp at 25,000 feet, but we only got there and, and another storm hit and, and all, again, we had to go all the way back down to base camp and. And this one lasted almost another week. And, and I tell you, with every day, it was really a struggle to safeguard 
our optimism and, and especially my commitment. But, you know, it finally cleared and four of us were picked to make a, an 11th hour attempt at the, at the top. And by this point, we were, God, almost totally out of food and supplies. So we put in one more camp. Um, you can't quite see it. It's around the corner there at about the 26,000 foot level. And then the next day, the, the weather held, but the climbing was pretty hard. Um, John and I were trying a direct finish that didn't work and we had to traverse over and follow the other two guys uh, up the, the, the finish, the Abruzzi Ridge finish. Um, and here we, this picture is just re reaching up to that area that's now called the bottleneck, but back then it didn't even have a name. And it involved uh, traversing over some pretty steep rock covered with ice at 27,000 feet. And um, this is uh, Jim Wickwire and, and Lou Reichert heading up just to, in front of John and me. And, and John and I didn't have any anchors, so he, he didn't want to have a rope. We actually climbed this whole thing unroped but finally at the end of the day um there's that picture that john was asking about on on the summit on a a really beautiful perfect day but i so exhausted i i just had to keep reminding myself that it must be kind of important that you know someday i was going to look back on this and and it, and it would mean something but right then it was hard to find any meaning in any of it other than just this gnawing reminder that i had to somehow get down alive and the descent took five days altogether there was more bad weather and you know getting into one camp at twenty five thousand feet i mean i actually literally had to crawl the last hundred feet but finally we reached base camp and we were greeted by our friends and at this point we'd been above eighteen thousand feet for 68 days in a row and we'd been at or above eight thousand meters for five days and nights. And I don't know if anybody's ever done that since then for that long at that high, but it had taken everything I could do to do it. This is a picture of me after I got back down to our base camp, just I'd lost about 35 pounds. Um, and uh, on the summit morning, it had been cold. It was 40 below zero when we, when we left the tent in the morning and my fingers were pretty frostbitten, but fortunately nothing, I didn't lose anything. Um, so you know we we pulled it off it was only the third ascent of k2 and and we did it by a no route that a new route that nobody's you know really climbed uh since then and i'd done it um you know like mike hoover's uh, uh wife and climbing partner bev johnson who was one of my best friends she told me you know you got to go about a project like this the same way you go back eating an elephant you just got to do it one bite at a time and, and never give up so i was back in the game you know i i didn't have any of those fears i'd taken off everest and carried up k2 and, and a couple of years later i uh, was invited to join an expedition to the people's republic the first year that china opened to foreign mountaineers and and i was part of a team that included uh yvonne chouinard um, also i know somebody that I mean, I'm assuming somebody that most of you guys know who lives in Jackson there. And we were going into a region in Eastern Tibet that no Westerner who had been to in 50 years to attempt this peak, Minyakonka, about 25,000 feet. And it had only been climbed twice ever. And it was my kind of trip to a really remote area that was hardly explored with a, a really good team of close friends, and including one named Jonathan Wright, who was also my business partner because we were a writer photographer team and and things were going okay until one day at 20,000 feet we were we were caught in an avalanche uh, and swept down the mountain about 1500 vertical feet and I was sure there's no way I was going to get out of it alive and but then it slowed and and stopped and and I was injured but I wasn't as badly injured as as Jonathan and and I tried to keep him alive but after about a half hour he he died while i was holding him in my in my arms and the next day we buried him under a mound of rocks next to where he had died and we, and we went home and and i went into a deep introspection wondering if i could or should keep climbing and 
and I just didn't know if I could. And it took me a couple of years to really think it through, to think about what I'd learned and what I'd taken from the high mountains, the high elevations and brought down to my life at sea level. And I, I thought about how on a climb you learn how to make a plan and inevitably stuff goes wrong and, and you learn how to adjust. And I thought about tenacity, about how on a big peak like K2, you know, you get to the top, like Bev Johnson told me, one bite at a time. And maybe the most important lesson, the, the one that was easiest to ignore because it seemed the most banal, but in truth, it was actually the hardest to learn because it's so omnipresent. And that was how the, the real goal isn't really the summit, but it's the footsteps it takes to get there. And those were some of the lessons I'd learned over the years. But after that avalanche, after Jonathan had died and I thought I was gonna die for a full minute, I thought I was dead. You know, I was, I was a different person. Sometimes I, I was waking up and the first thing that entered my mind was how amazing it was just to be alive. And I remember one day I was walking to my car, to my office, and I stopped in the parking lot just to stand there and, and feel the difference uh, between the side of my face that was in the sun and the side that was in shadow. And in a way, I was feeling like I'd been reborn with this kind of new awareness about just being alive. And with that, a new awareness of how quickly any of us, all of you guys cannot be alive. And a few years later, I ran into that poem by Mary Oliver, that famous one called Summer's Day with its famous last line that summarized the challenge I was facing. The one when she said at the end, tell me, tell me what you plan to do with your one wild and precious life. And that was a challenge. <clears throat> and that was a challenge that included whether I was going to go back to climbing. But meanwhile, I had my professional life working as a writer and filmmaker and a photographer. And, and Jonathan's family <clears throat> asked me to complete a story that he and I had been writing for National Geographic on the newly chartered Mount Everest National Park. And I decided to do it, to do it for Jonathan and for his family, and also someday for his little daughter, who was only a year old when, when he had died in my arms. So I returned to Kathmandu, and, and I was in the bar in the Yak and Yeti Hotel when I saw this woman in the lobby, and I had the waiter send her a drink, and she came over and we introduced ourselves and she wanted to know where I lived. And, and I said, well, I, I had this quaint beach cottage just south of Santa Barbara when the reality was I, I had this surfer shack on a low rent beach just north of Oxnard, but the line worked and a year later, Jennifer and I got married. And, and I'd come to realize that it wasn't a coincidence that I made this shift in my life so soon after Jonathan had died in my arms and so soon after I'd nearly died myself. And, and it wasn't chance that Jennifer and I started our family right away without pausing at all. Uh, but that made it more difficult to decide whether I was gonna return to mountaineering, but, but that's what I did. And, and, and it was so much of <clears throat> who I'd become. Uh, and it wasn't just as a climber, but it was all that time in, in wildness and nature. And even with the family, I still was wrestling whether the rewards outweighed the risk. But then I was also asking myself, well, what if the right people with the right project come along? You know, would I, would I consider going back? And what would Jennifer think? And, and then it happened. I got a call from these two guys, <clears throat> Frank Wells on the right, who at the time was the president of Warner Brothers Studios and Dick Bass, who owned the Snowbird Ski Resort. And, and by coincidence, they learned they both shared a lifelong dream to 
climbed the highest peak on each of the seven continents and they had hardly any climbing experience. And they're both nearly 50 years old and uh, they would need guides to help them up the mountains and help them organize the expeditions. And they invited me to join them on any of the seven climbs. And I asked Jennifer what she thought. And, and she said, you know, Rick, maybe the bigger risk is, is not going, not staying true to who you are. And, and maybe just as importantly, or maybe more importantly, not meeting new people who could perhaps take you new directions. So she told me that even though, you know, I'd be guiding these guys on the climbs, Frank and Dick, that, that maybe in turn they could guide me. Uh, and I tell you, that wasn't the first time that I realized in a marriage, two plus two can be a lot more than one. So with her support, um, I went on three of the seven summits, uh, climbing Aconcagua here, the highest peak in South America. And we all got to the top, including Yvonne, who was on that trip. And, and from there, I went back to Everest. And, and this time, my role wasn't as a guide, but I was the color commentator on a TV special. And um, one of the cameramen, the, the guy who took this photograph, is another Jackson uh, resident who I know many of you probably know, Peter Palafian. Uh, but <clears throat> Frank and Dick miss Everest. Dick got up near the top. He got to 28,000 feet, but that didn't hold them back. They went on and climbed the highest peaks in North America and Africa and Australia and, 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 and Europe, where here you see them on the summit of Mount Elbrus. Uh, and the last on the list was the Vincent Massif, the highest peak in Antarctica. And I joined a, again on this expedition as a guide, and we were on this one, the first private expedition <clears throat> to ever reach the interior of Antarctica in that old retrofitted DC-3 you see there in the background. And we all got to the summit. This is a shot of me on the top of what then was only the third ascent uh, of Vincent. And But Frank and Dick had missed Everest. And, and even though Frank had to go back to work, uh, Dick went back to Everest. Uh, and at age 55, reached the top, becoming the the first to climb the seven summits. And, and he called me from base camp when he got back down and he said, Rick, it just goes to show you that the second half, and I knew by that it was his shorthand for life after 50, the second half can be and should be the best half. Well, I, I took that one to heart and my wife was right. Um, I was learning from these guys uh, more, uh, than they learned from me as a guide. Uh, and I went back to my life, uh, lived wild uh, in the mountains. Uh, and now I had to commit to that life and also to my family life. And as any of you can imagine, um, that wasn't easy at all. It, it wasn't without friction, but Jennifer and I made it work because well, filming and photography and writing was about my life live in the wild. Well, that's how I made my living. And that was a, a big part of it. But we had to work together, the two of us, to really decide you know, where I was going to draw the lines. And the mountains weren't the only places I went. But uh, also, I had jungle trips, uh, including this one. Uh, the same year as the Seven Summits trips, uh, where we made the first crossing of Borneo at its widest point, 800 miles as the hornbill flew, but probably more like 2,000 following all the winds and bends in the river. And then on another jungle adventure, our objective was a secluded granite spire that rose 2,000 vertical feet out of the Amazon in a region of the jungle that was only um, 80 miles that was 80 miles past the last Yanomami village. And, and that was a village that had been visited by anthropologists only in the last 10 years. And, and we hired several of these Yanomami to help us carry gear. And one day, one of them dropped his load and headed into the forest. And, and I followed him realizing he'd heard a troop of monkeys. And then he stopped and from a distance, I saw him calling to make the monkeys curious. And, and sure enough, they came in for, for a closer look. And, and he drew his arrow and shot and missed. But, but that image embedded in my head like a song that you can't get rid of. And, and finally, I realized what it was. It was that I was looking at who 
I used to be. And there were more adventures, including one in Africa, climbing Kilimanjaro, the highest peak on that continent. But the summit was where this trip only started because from the top, we walked 500 kilometers east all the way to the Indian Ocean, crossing the bushlands of the twin Savo National Parks that together are the size of Israel. And it was a, a 500 kilometer trek on foot and at eye level with wild animals that put you a few rungs down the food chain. And then there was another expedition, the one that Jimmy referred to across Northwest Tibet. But this time we were following <clears throat> this animals called the Shiru uh, that are actually uh, a goat that lives in this mo most remote margin of the Tibetan plateau. And, and the animals were in danger because poachers were killing them by the tens of thousands for their fur that was woven into expensive shawls uh, that had become this fashion hit. And biologists were concerned that if the poachers discovered the Shiru's calving grounds, it might be game over for this endangered species, species that, that each summer migrated to some unknown place to have their babies. And the biologists needed to discover where it was so that they could persuade the Chinese to protect it. But it was an area completely uninhabited and, and they just couldn't get there. But what if I got some of my climbing buddies and we followed the migration on foot, carrying our supplies and custom made rickshaws? Well, we had to walk 300 miles. And at the start, each of our carts weighed 275 pounds. And the average elevation at that part of the plateau was 16,000 feet. And, and after a couple of weeks of more calories going out than in, uh, even Conrad Anchor, uh, who you guys know is one of the toughest climbers on the planet, uh, he was feeling it. But then after three weeks, we, we found this high snow dusted plateau with thousands of these animals congregating uh, and uh, in a place nobody could bother them. Uh, and after a day or two, we witnessed them starting to have their babies. So we documented the calving grounds and we wrote an article and made a movie for National Geographic. And, and all the publicity convinced the Chinese to create a protected area around the calving grounds. And, and since then, the animals have been increasing. Uh, and it was a big transitional trip for me, not just for Jimmy, but me too, because I realized that the conservation of wildlife and wildlands was, was something that I wanted uh, to do more of. And on other trips at the same period of my life, um, I was learning so much from some of my other companions, uh, Yvonne Chouinard on the right and, and Doug Tompkins. And these guys had been close friends and climbing partners since the early 1960s. And, and they'd also started, as all of you know, the iconic climbing and outdoor equipment companies. Um, Doug making sleeping bags and, and packs and, and parkas and, and jackets. And back in the early 60s, he called his company the North Face. And a few years later, Yvonne started uh, Patagonia. Uh, and as some of you I'm sure know, he gave the company that name you know, because of the adventure that he and Doug had made down there when they were both still in their early 20s. And they had taken an old Ford van and and driven it all the way to Patagonia on a trip that had a huge influence on, on them. And in turn, that had had just a huge ripple effect on me and the climbers in, in my generation. <laughs> the, so the ripple effect of this one trip has reached out uh, for so long in so many ways. But I'll let uh, Yvonne and Doug uh, talk about themselves, that themselves in this little video clip from a movie we made a few years ago called 180 South. Doug on the left there got back from this trip. He sold the North Face and he joined his wife Susie starting a new company called Esprit that they built into a billion dollar brand. But eventually Doug got disillusioned with making a lot of stuff that he realized nobody really needed. And when his marriage fell apart, he, he sold his half and he moved to a remote part of Southern Chile and started buying wildlands to convert them into national parks. And, and then he fell in love with this woman named Chris McDivitt, who ran Yvonne's company, Patagonia. And that's Chris on the right there. And she's also one of my very closest friends. 
And eventually she left Patagonia, the company and moved to Patagonia, the place and joined Doug and the two of them, you know, would go on over the next 25 years to create over 16 million acres of new national parks in Chile and Argentina and, and make it the biggest conservation win by private individuals in, in the history of conservation. And I was really privileged to have a part in that effort with uh, right from the beginning uh, with um, uh, joining them on the board. And, and then I was also really fortunate to have a chance to join Patagonia. Uh, and like uh, Doug and Yvonne, uh, apply what I'd learned from my years in nature as a climber and explorer the way Yvonne and the others ran the company because fundamentally, as you guys know, Patagonia is in business to use this business as a agent for environmental protection. And uh, Yvonne said it best uh, when he came up with the company's current mission statement that they're in business to save all of our home planet. And at Patagonia, I was there for 15 years and I, I just got to work with so many terrific people committed to that same higher calling. And the people included interns uh, who came each summer and filled 10 positions from a pool of about 10,000 applicants that, that made it harder to get into Patagonia's intern program than it was to get into Harvard. One of the interns included a young woman who was a really active outdoor athlete. Uh, and she was only 20 years old. Uh, and oh, she had just turned 20, but she was only a year old when her father, uh, Jonathan, had, uh, had died in my arms after that avalanche in Tibet. And Jonathan had named her Asia after his favorite place in the world. And, and after we had buried him in that remote place in Tibet, Yvonne and I had stayed in touch with little Asia, seeing her every couple of years as she grew up, and kind of trying to be Phil and fathers a little bit. And now she was a intern. And I knew that before the summer was over, she was going to want to know about her father. And because her mother had really shut his memory out of their lives. And, and sure enough, at the end of the summer, she asked me if we could have a talk. And, you know, I didn't hold back. I, I told her about the avalanche and about how I held her father in my arms. And I gave him mouth to mouth for over a half hour didn't work, died in my arms. And, and she thanked me. And, but then she said that wasn't the reason she wanted to have a talk. She said she had a favor. She wanted me to take her back to the mountain where father died to climb the flank and, and find his grave and, and find him. And I told her I needed to think about it. So I went to Jennifer and, and she said, well, listen, of course you're going because Asia's not asking you to find her father. She's asking you to be her father. And I knew that if Jonathan had, had lived, he would have taken her on some of his trips and that certainly those trips would have included Asia, the place. So that's what Asia and I did. We journeyed to the Everest region where I had a lot of Sherpa friends who had been Jonathan's friends who now became Asia's friends. And we went to Western Tibet uh, into mountains that had hardly been explored where we had to endure hurricane winds to climb a 21,000 foot peak that was unnamed and at least until that day, unclimbed. And, and then in Eastern Tibet, we approached the flank of Minyakonka where her father had died and it had been 20 years. And, I wasn't sure I could find the grave. Finally, on, a, on this high barren buttress, we did find it only now it had been disturbed probably by a, a snow leopard. So we gathered my old buddy's bones, Asian me, and we reburied him and strung fresh prayer flags over the grave and said our own prayers and made our own thanksgivings and, and started the long journey home. And the full trip, the, the pilgrimage took about two months. And in that time I shared with Asia the 
stories and the lessons from those stories that I knew her father would have shared with her. And there are a lot of the lessons that I've shared with you this evening about how, as I said, you have to make a plan, but know that stuff happens. So you need to know how to change and adjust and how you get to the top the same way you eat the elephant, one bite at a time. How you need to go about your life knowing that it's not about the summit, but the footsteps that it's the way that you get there that counts. That in your work life, as well as your home life, your life has to have a purpose. And that purpose needs to be more than just about you, but about how you can be more than just yourself. So knowing what you know now, I challenge everybody the same way I challenged myself all those years before, the same way I have to re-challenge myself all the time to tell yourself, what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? Thank you guys. So I will. Thank you, Rick. Hold on, I can't find my cursor here. <laughs> there it is. Am I back, Leah? Yep, you're back. And now we can see everybody who has their cameras off. Um, now we can, if there's any questions, um, we can ask them to Rick. And again, this is a regular Zoom call, not a webinar. So everybody can interact with each other here. Does anyone have a question? You can either raise your hand if your camera is on and I can call on you or use the hand raising function and I can call on you. Um, Patrick Power in the chat says he has a question. If you wanna unmute yourself, Patrick, and ask it directly to Rick. Awesome. Hey, Rick, how are you? Hi, Patrick. How's it going? <laughs> it's going great. I hope you had a good evening. Oh, it's awesome. Um, to be honest, it's been fantastic hearing your stories. And uh, this is pretty cool, um, kind of bit of a roundabout way. Um, you know, your film, well, not your film, but um, Chenard's and Tompkins' film, uh, 180 South, was uh, super impactful to me uh, growing up. It brought me to um, Southern Argentina and El Shell 10 a number of years ago. And uh, it's pretty cool to be able to talk to you uh, during all this. So uh, thank you so much for uh, being a uh, a bit of a mentor in my life and i'm hoping to ask you one question uh, to start things off um you mentioned so so much in all of your talks uh but the one thing that kind of was i wanted to know um was during all your time uh what's been like one of the most impactful things uh you've learned over all your years in the mountains i know you've got a ton of experience but uh if you could put it down in, in one uh one short sentence what would you say yeah i don't know how short i can be <laughs> And it took a really long time to figure this thing out, Patrick, but you know, the biggest lesson of all from all that time in wildness and nature is the deep realization that death is a prerequisite of life. And I, I know there was an interview in your newspaper today where I got to talk to the interviewer about that a little bit, but um, you know, getting that lesson into your bones uh, is maybe one of the most important things any of us can take from nature. You know, nature is a brutal place. If you've been out there a lot, all of you guys know that. Uh, and, and you know how all life begins and ends with death and death becomes life. And, and that is the circle of life and it's built into it. And getting that into your bones, uh, for me anyway, has given me a real a resilience uh, uh, in life to uh, all the things that inevitably happen to all of us uh, that are you know, that without that, you might just call it tragedies, but with that, they become just the things that happen to all of us in life. And that resilience gives you strength to get through those otherwise tragedies. Uh, and even through what I consider road bumps like COVID, unless of course it ends your life. But even then, if you practice for your own death, <laughs> you know, then uh, that uh, you're stronger for 
uh, against that as well, even if you lose your life from something like this pandemic. Awesome. Great. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Sorry to get heavy on everybody, but, but this is your of, own death. Wow. Uh, anyone else have a question? Uh, Cameron Richards, you can unmute yourself. And oh, then hi. Heather. All right. Uh, hi, Rick. How are you doing today? Hi, Cameron. Um, I just, I know you, uh, you worked for Patagonia for a while, and I was wondering um, during your time at Patagonia, um, what your most uh, proud accomplishment is in what you've done with their sort of in their environmental affairs program or sorry in your role is that well um, I you know I I was in I kind of had the idea and um, was uh, responsible for that ad many years ago that ran in the New York Times called don't buy this jacket where we were trying to get our customers to really think about the environmental impact of the stuff we made and you guys bought uh, and it really worked. It was pretty successful for starting that conversation up. Uh, and then that later, um, I had a chance to turn that into a program or initiative at Patagonia that's still uh, a big part of what the company does now called Warmware. Mm -hmm. um, back in the beginning, we called it Common Threads, but it was meant to be a, right from the beginning, a, a partnership with all of you, all of you who are Patagonia customers to take mutual responsibility for the stuff the company makes and you buy um, the company does absolutely everything it can to uh, make its products with, uh, as it says, no unnecessary harm, uh, minimum impact possible to people and planet. But as our one, our, our ad, don't buy this jacket said, even then it causes a lot of, there's still a big impact. And you guys have to be responsible for taking care of the product and, and not buying stuff you, more than you need is part of that um, commitment. And uh, then keeping it repaired is part of the commitment and uh, putting it in the hands of somebody that can wear it if you're not wearing it is part of the commitment. And then bringing it back for recycling, uh, using the best technology available is part of the commitment. So you see it's a partnership between company and customer. Um, and in, 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 a, in a sense, it's like a loyalty program upside down. Uh, because you know, like a, a normal company's loyalty program tries to get you to buy more shit. Patagonia's loyalty programs to get you to buy less shit yeah. than you need. So I'm really proud of that one. <laughs> yeah, uh, I actually have a pair of jeans I bought from one wear back in 2017, kind of in the early days that I bought secondhand on there. I wore them for four years and I just gave them off to my brother to wear his work pants. So they're, they're getting awesome. a nice hard life out of them. So it's pretty good. Way to go. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Heather Max Claro. Hey, thanks. Hi, Rick. My name is Heather. This is my dad, Jack. We're big fans of yours. Hi, uh, Heather. Hi, Jack. Hi. So my question, I'm trying to think of how to phrase it succinctly. One of the things I loved about this recent book is how often you talked about giving back to the wild and keeping it wild. And you were just discussing that too. I have also lived a lot of my life in the wild and I have this really difficult time transitioning from Western culture life to life in the wild and kind of back and forth. And I think that Western culture has gotten more and more away from being people who live in the wild. And what I would love to see is that we could bring Western culture and the wild closer together. And I wonder if you think that's possible or how you think we could do that. Well, Heather, I'm trying to do it right now. All right, good. <laughs> I'm not trying to proselytize everybody, you know, to, to get back into the wild and trying to show, you know, not, not you and Jack, you guys already know this, but the others that, that, that aren't close to nature and don't understand what the wild can teach us to, to get out there and, and, and learn its lessons, you know, to like uh, Emerson and Thoreau taught us so many centuries ago. Um, I don't know, I, 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 I hope that all of us trying to, you know, that I, I hope I can use the, I hope through this book that there, there's a, a, a few people whose lives may be going a little different direction uh, than they were in before they read it. That's always the hope any author has, I suppose. And I, I certainly have that for this book. Um, and, and I'm gonna keep out on the road, uh, from, you know, talking to people like you. And uh, I'm also gonna do my best to engage uh, with audiences that aren't in the choir, like most of you are already. <laughs> and um, 
try to get them to think a little differently. And I, I really want to get, I continue to get in front of as many business people as I can to um, share with them uh, what we, what I learned from Patagonia, what they taught me, what the companies out there still teaching all of us. Uh, and I'd love to get in front of some business leaders. I, I mean, my dream is to get in front of, um, you know, Bezos and Musk. I mean, and I'd love to be able to look those guys in the face and say, you know, you might be the two richest dudes in the world, but um, short term, uh, your companies, of course, are cranking it, but long term, they're doing way more harm than they are good. Uh, and I'd love to explain to them why that's the case and how I learned that from my time in nature and how through Yvonne's leadership and guidance and mentorship with me, I learned how you can take those lessons back from the wild world and apply them to your business in a way that makes your business truly sustainable long-term, unlike what those guys are doing. I'd love to look them in the face and say, <clears throat> you know what, guys? <clears throat> if we're not careful, we're gonna turn Earth into Mars, but there's no way in hell you're ever gonna turn Earth, Mars into Earth because they don't get it. Yeah, right. they don't. Right. They don't even get that most basic tenet. And you know why? Because they don't know nature. They don't know how our world really works. And because of that, they don't respect it because they don't know it. That's true. Maybe I can take them on a rafting trip. That's a great <laughs> idea. All right. I love it. Well, we're in there with you. If I meet either of those guys, I'll yeah. say, hey, I've got someone for you to talk to. Okay. It's a deal. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Mike Norris, I see you have your hand up. Actually, it's his wife, Beth, that's commenting. <laughs> Hi, Beth. Hey. Hi, Beth. Hey, Rick, I, I haven't had the chance to read the book yet, um, but I'll probably be getting it, getting it here very shortly. But um, you talk, you're, you, when you're talking about losing your friend up on the mountain, um, I lost my youngest son in a car accident when he was 15 years old. And he was this amazing kid. And um, had this huge massive life ahead of him and you talk you know like when you just as you were talking about when you lost your friend losing my son has really changed my life in a way that i would never expect it to change my life um one well one i mean i i live a much larger life than i ever lived before because part of me is living up um, his life for him at the same time um but because I've lived through the worst possible day of my life and there's absolutely nothing else that could be worse than that. I have two other boys. Um, I could have equally worse days, but there is nothing else in this world that can be worse than that day. I have found a certain freedom from fear uh, and freedom from um, a lot of things that restrict people's lives. And it, it's been just uh, just the most bizarre outcome of his death and I just kind of wonder if you kind of feel the same same way you know um same way having been on the mountain and losing your friend and having to hold you know trying to you know keep life in him and hold him as his life passed away and I just kind of wondering if you know if that's kind of if you found that uh freedom and stuff too you know Beth <clears throat> empathy and any of ours ability to extend empathy to our fellow humans um, stops with your experience. Uh, you know, I have three children, like all of you on this, on this, who have children and who, you know, have thought through, as we all do, uh, what our response would be if we were in Beth's shoes. We can't do that. We can't, we can't understand that without probably having been there, Beth. So having said that, I've also understood from the loss of my friends and, and I lost my wife of 40 years a couple years ago, um, that the only true immortality any of us own and can hope for is the extent to which we live after we're gone in the minds and hearts of those we leave behind. And you know that deeply, don't you? That's kind of what you just said. And uh, 
it's a it's a lesson that takes a, a often many decades and years to learn but um i suppose if i'm owning of any single religion tenant that uh is close to a religion it's that one mm -hmm. thank, thank you. you beverly boyton i see you have your hand up yeah i do um Rick, I don't know if I can explain this well, but it has to do with um, being on a trip and then getting to a village and um, many, I go to the Arctic in Canada and Alaska. So those are the villages that I've been to. And many times it went well, I, you know, I'm really sincerely interested in um, how they're living, what they think. Um, climate change on and on. And many people um, are interested in talking back. But I went to a very tiny village a couple of years ago, uh, Point Lay. Um, and they did not want, not everybody, it was divided, but some very much did not want anybody coming to their village or on their lands. They were afraid that you'd interfere with the beluga migration or um, would pick up uh, fossils or that they'd have to rescue you. A lot of different things. Um, but along with that, I was having wonderful conversations and learning more about these people and trying to explain what we were doing there and what it meant to us. Um, but ultimately, they took our case before the council and we had to fly out immediately that day. And I wasn't done with my questions. But have you ever encountered that kind of a kind of a mixed reception, but definitely the more that we don't want anybody here? Well, um, I've had uh some hostile receptions initially uh, in some remote villages, but um, I've never had a case where eventually I wasn't able to overcome them and build enough of a rapport to be able to to stay until you know I was uh, I had wanted to leave. I, I never been kicked out. <laughs> um, I did have a, an experience once that was perhaps a little bit kind. Of, maybe it's in the same category of experiences you just described where I, uh, with Yvonne and Doug and some others, John Ross Kelly, we all went to Bhutan the first year that it opened outside Mountaineers to attempt the highest unclimbed mountain in the world called Gangra Punsam. And it's one of the stories in my book. Uh, those of you who read the book know that we didn't get to climb the mountain because we couldn't find it. We got lost and we were, the place was so unknown, we got lost. But um, a story that's not in the book that, uh, hit the editor's floor and I'll put on my website eventually was how years later I I had an idea to go back to the mountain to try it again but by then it had, it had closed the Bhutanese closed the mountain they didn't want anybody there because it was a sacred peak and um, I had this idea what if my buddies and I went back and and we tried to climb the mountain but just below the summit if we were to get that high when it was right in front of us we would turn back and go down and leave it unclimbed at the very top uh, as a way to express kinship and alliance with uh, the Buddhist principles by which they run their own country. And so I had a meeting with the people actually running the country right at the top. And uh, they really liked the idea. National Geographic sponsored it. And uh, they said, OK, well, we'll give you a permit for it. And then they said, but you know, we got to run it by the villagers out there. So about a month later, I got on a phone call with them and they said, well, they were really apologetic. I mean, these are the guys, they were the ministers running the country. And they said, we're sorry, but the local villagers said that the whole mountain's sacred, not just the summit. <laughs> they said, <laughs> they said, and, and, and so, about a week later, I wrote back to the Bhutanese and I said, you know what? I think the villagers are right. Like, um, let's re definitely let's respect their opinion, which the, the government was going to do anyway. They, were gonna they weren't going to do it without the villagers on board. 
And I learned something from that. Um, it was a big lesson for me. So I don't know if there's any insight into that from that anecdote into what you experienced or not, but. Yeah, it, I mean, it, it's hard when you so much want to know more, yeah. uh, but they're not put on the world to educate you necessarily. Some, some wanted to, but others didn't. I just came away with such a feeling of unfinished conversations. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It's a little after eight. Are you still good with answering a few more questions, Rick? Sure. Okay. Who, does anyone else have a question? Uh, Kuwana, you can unmute yourself. Thank you. Um, I'm Kuwana. It's really a pleasure to meet you, Rick. Um, I just finished the book last month and have bought it for a friend who's graduating. He's getting his PhD, we're geologists, and it, it's just changed me so much. I wanted him to have the book too, so thank you. Um, just a quick comment. As I was reading, I made notes of some of my favorite quotes, some of the things you wrote in there. Side note, taking a job I wasn't sure about, commit, then figure it out, <laughs> was timed perfectly. But one of the quotes that, I have in front of me that really kind of, I've been feeling for a long time, but I feel like it was really, I think, emphasized well in the book. Um, my time in wilderness was affording me a greater awareness of how in the web of life, I was an animal among animals. Mm -hmm. And just as a geologist and also, you know, in, in, involved in, you know, teaching my students about protecting the environment. Um, I feel like as a species, we forgot that like we see ourselves as we're humans, we're the most intelligent. And then those are all animals, <laughs> right? But we forget, I think that we are animals, um, albeit like incredibly talented at destroying everything because I don't know, maybe our intelligence or level of intelligence will be our downfall. But I just, I really appreciated how you had put that in the words because I feel like I've been feeling that for a long time um, but, you know, again, like not everyone sees it that way. So I just wanted to thank you for that as well. So kind of well, a lengthy comment, but. <laughs> you're welcome, uh, Kiana. Thank you for that. And, you know, writing a book is, this one took a lot of work. <clears throat> uh, I wrote it once and, uh, and, and, and it didn't work. So I had to completely rewrite, it took a couple of years. But all that work is made so worthwhile and it makes the whole effort so fulfilling when, people like yourself um, when it connects with with readers like you, Kuana. So thank you so much. That means a lot to me. Appreciate it. Thank you. And there's a comment in the chat that says from Brendan, I work for Patagonia in Brooklyn, New York. Come do an event at our store and yell at the corporations with us. Oh, Brendan. You got an okay. invitation to Patagonia oh. Brooklyn. And I, I may go speak at a, you know, with the virus letting up a little bit. I got an email today, Brendan, that um, from Patagonia asking if I might want to do a, a little bit of a in-person tour in some stores this later this spring. So, you know, let me keep that one in mind. So maybe we can make that happen. Is there one more question from the audience? Drop it in the chat. All right. Well, thank you, Rick Ridgeway, for coming to Teton County Library virtually and being part of Mountain Story 2022. Let's all give a big hand yeah. to Rick. And um, the next Mountain Story event is February 16th with uh, Katie Ives, who's the editor of The Alpinist, and she is talking about her brand new book, Imaginary Peaks. And it's online again, so you can go to tclib.org, I'll write it in the chat, slash Mountain Story to log on to that. And thank you very much. And we did record this, so we will be posting it on our um, Mountain Story website as well. So thank you again. Yes, thank you, Leah. And thank all of you for coming this evening. Good night, everybody. Good night.